Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Pinellas. I'm a doctor of acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine. Welcome to tonight's talk, Living with the Elements, A Path to Healing and Restoring Connection, a Holistic and Torah Approach. I'm dedicating this talk to my daughter, Meira. Thank you, Meira, and to all the children of all ages that I work with. Um, this is for you. This is for all of us. I've been in clinical practice over 14 years, and I've been immersed in the study and application of holistic healing modalities for over 25 years. The crux of my work is in alleviating the physical manifestations of emotional pain, and it's it's here that I've been working with men, women, and children over the years in what we call in the field of Chinese medicine, root branch medicine. What does this mean? It means that our medicine, holistic medicine, treats both the roots and branches of disease. The branches are the symptoms of, of disease, the outer manifestation, what the body is showing, or what the mind is showing, calling our attention that there's an imbalance, there's pain. So this is physical pain, this is sciatica, this is insomnia, eczema, so on and so forth. We also treat the roots of disease, the underlying imbalance or cause for why these branches, these symptoms are showing themselves in the body. And it's here that every Chinese medicine practitioner is trained and hopefully practicing the medicine. We're working to alleviate the pain and the suffering in the moment of the symptoms of the branches the body's presented with, all the while always searching for the root cause of the disease and the imbalance, treating that at the same time as we're treating the symptoms, all the while working to educate and call the patient to their own understanding of their cause of their imbalance so that they can do real deep healing and also, God willing, prevent future occurrences of these branches of these symptoms in their body. In Chinese medicine, we, we talk about three causes of disease. I'm gonna be a little technical and then help get into, uh, help us understanding our children more and what they're going through these days. There's three causes of disease. There's, um, one is the external causes. These are outside pathogens that we say invade the body. So this is bacteria or a virus that comes into the body and causes symptoms. The work of the medicine and the acupuncture is to expel the pathogen um, and take care of any symptoms that may, it may have left in its wake. The second cause of disease is emotional. So yes, emotions do cause physical symptoms. This is ancient medicine going back thousands of years, thousands of years of clinical data on emotions causing disease. And as we're gonna see tonight, these emotions are coming from inside the body, from the neck down not from the head, not the brain. The emotions are coming from the body, the organs themselves. And when they come out of balance and move into extremes, they will cause emotions of ext like extreme anger, severe grief, high anxiety, obsessive compulsive thinking, okay? So these emotions and these energetic movements will cause symptoms like IBS, migraines, insomnia, physical pain, brain fog, so on and so forth. And the third cause of disease is lifestyle. Lifestyle habits, like the way we've learned to sleep or not sleep enough at night, the foods we're eating, our work-life balance, all of these things will impact and can also cause disease. A lot of modern day diseases, as we know, can be prevented by the types of foods we're eating, the things we're ingesting, the chemicals and the air that we're exposing ourselves to. And surely the lifestyle and emotional components and the causes of disease are interconnected. And we're always working with both at the same time. My work over the years has been mostly with, been with young, ad young adults and adults in their ages 20s through their 50s, showing up with these physical symptoms of pain, disharmony, migraines, depression, anxiety, menstrual irregularities, infertility, so on and so forth. And, we, and, and the medicine is good, Bor Hashem, and it alleviates the pain. But what I began to notice almost always over the years, and certainly in the last three years, is that most of 
most of these patients, th hundreds and thousands of people I've been working with, can trace back in their lives when things changed or the root cause of the pain, and it's almost always a childhood trauma, a childhood event, an experience of life as a child that shifted everything for them, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. And now what's happening is that I'm beginning to see young teens and children as young as five years old being asked to brought in by their parents with various, the various diagnoses that we're familiar with, ADD, ADHD, ODD, anxiety, insomnia, depression, social anxiety, learning challenges, sibling rivalry, the child is shut down, the child can't get up in the morning, um, the child's disrespectful, the child's not listening, um, the child's not motivated. These are things that parents are bringing um, their kids in for, <clears throat> whether of their own accord or, whether, or because a school has asked them to and has asked them to um, medicate the child or the child can't return to the school. Um, so for, let me give an example. A, a cu young couple brought in their five-year-old daughter because the school said that she couldn't um, settle in the classroom. It was hard to keep control of the classroom with her there. She was constantly moving, leaving, um, and the parents, you, you know, did whatever interventions they could. The school said, you know, take her to a psychiatrist. We cannot have her back if she's not medicated. The parents took her to the psychiatrist. The psychiatrist said, I cannot medicate a child this young. We don't do that. <laughs> it doesn't work. Parents took this back to the school. School didn't know what to do with it. Still didn't want to take the child back um, for the coming year. So the child couldn't be medicated, but the child was struggling. What wasn't asked, what the, what the school didn't ask, and I don't judge because they don't know, because Eastern and Western medicine and th ways of thinking have been so disconnected from each other for too long, that no one thought to ask, does this child sleep at night? Is this child eating enough? What's the relationship at home with mother and child? What were the circumstances around this child's birth and delivery? Because all of these will impact the child's behavior and manifestation. So thankfully, and very quickly, on the right amount of herbal medicine to address the root cause of this child's imbalance, hyperactivity, inability to sleep, inability to eat, by addressing the root cause with the proper herbal medicine, with mom and dad doing their work on connecting deeper with their child, with, um, with some energy therapy and some more support, the child is sleeping through the night without melatonin, um, more behaved, more connected at school, and certainly more connected at home. And this is beautiful, and this is gonna come up soon, is hugging her parents more. This child was not affectionate. Something broke somewhere. This child stopped being affectionate. Now she can hug and even ask for hugs. And so my call tonight is not just to educate us on the root causes of what our children are going through and to learn how to work with them, support them, and help them heal, but to invite the Western medical practitioners, the school administrators, the therapists, the psychologists, to learn about Eastern medicine, to learn about the root causes of behavior and emotional imbalance, because it's through this, through this an integrated approach, that we can really help our kids really feel better and also create a lot more love and peace in the home. It's also important because some of these kids are over-medicated and suffering from it. For some of them, the medications don't work. Some children get put on 10, 12, 15 different medications and they don't get helped and they suffer through it. Um, and again, as I keep saying, we're, not, we're missing the core issue of what happened to create these, this outer manifestation, these branches of symptoms um, for the child. This is important work, and this is work we get to do now because we get to hopefully prevent these children from becoming the adults that I see in my office, young adults um, 
and older adults who cannot express themselves, who can't communicate their needs, whose self-esteem has been shattered or never built, um, and who have a lot of trouble pursuing their dreams and fulfilling their purpose in this world. These adults are struggling with joy. They're ridden with anxiety and fear. And um, they're mourning childhood pain. They can't move forward in life because they're stuck in the past. Okay, And not to mention all the physical symptoms the body will show up to get attention for these inner wounds, these older wounds to be healed. The migraines, high blood pressure, hormonal imbalances, so on and so forth. So the image of the iceberg, okay, it's, it reminds us that there's what we see and then there's what's underneath. So again, the root branch. There's the symptoms a person or a child is showing us and there's what's underneath. We're gonna talk a little bit tonight about what's underneath as well. What I see clinically is affecting these young children and their physical, emotional well-being are one, their physical constitution, so how the, yes, how they're coming into the world physically, the circumstances around their conception and their delivery, the early attachment period, period with mom, the health of the mother herself, emotionally and physically, ancestry, <clears throat> so what ancestors have been through, the traumas they carry, the environment of the home, Social, their social life, their learning styles, and um, any trauma that occurred early in life. So I'm gonna use Chinese medicine five element system theory to help us understand a few things. To help us understand life, this is how I learn to live life, um, and I'm I'm here to share it with you because it's aligned with, it's, this is ancient universal wisdom, and in a few minutes I'm gonna show how it's Torah-based. Five element system theory is a way the Chinese dis philosophers were able to, dis thousands of years ago, were able to describe how disease happens. They did it, they were able to know it by observing how, by observing nature and how it moves. Superimpose that on the, on the body, because man is, is an entire world, a microcosm of the world. From here, they understood how disease develops and how to treat it. So too with us, we're gonna learn these elements, how to treat them, how to understand them, how to see them in our kids and in ourselves, and then how to use words and touch and food and time to heal them, to get them into balance. This is rooted in Torah. I learned it um, a long time ago in Chinese medicine school, but only recently learned the roots in Torah, and I'm so excited to share. It's sourced in Midrash Rabbah Bamidbar, the Zohar, our Kabbalistic um, work, and the Rambam in Yisodei HaTorah discusses it, and I'm sure there's more, but I don't know, because I don't know enough Torah. But all of these um, reliable sources say that the entire physical world is made up of four elements, fire, wind, earth, and water. In Torah, there's four elements discussed. In Chinese medicine theory, it's five. We're gonna keep it with five to help us understand the kids better, but you'll see how they're, the wood and fire are really one. In Torah, they're, considered, they're one. In, in the medicine, we separate it. In this book by Balvavi, Getting to Know Your Soul, it goes into the uh, Torah source for these, for these elements and helps you to understand, helps a person understand their personality, their soul, their makeup, what makes them tick, and how to work with the extremes of personality. <clears throat> um, and since, since finding this book, I found many more, many more um, Jewish texts coming out about the elements. It's very exciting. The Alter Rebbe in Tanya chapter one also talks about these elements. Okay, these are our sources. The, Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe says, just as the four elements of fire, air, water, and earth are the foundation of all physical entities, so everything in the physical universe, so too is the nefesh comprised of these four elements. 
The nefesh is one aspect of the soul that resides in the blood, which flows throughout the body and all the organs. And it's here, these four elements, the fire, the water, the air, and the earth, that make up our emotions and what we have to work with when we're working with our kids and their emotional pain and their physical pain. <clears throat> the Alter Rebbe says fire rises upward and is associated with anger and arrogance. And water is associated with the appetite for pleasure. Um, air, is this air in Ch the Chinese, we're going to call it metal, is associated with speech. And the earth element can be associated with melancholy and um, sloth. <clears throat> The Alter Rebbe continues to say where this nefesh originates, that it's clothed in the blood of the body. So these elements that comprise our very natures, our emotions, they live in the blood. And it is the root source of our negative character traits, our challenges in life, the, the work we have to do here. But it's also the root of the positive traits inherited in, er, inherent in every Jewish person's character. So these aspects, these four elements, these five elements comprise who we are. They are the reason behind the speech and behaviors you're seeing in your children, the shouting, the anger, the shutdown, the inability to eat, the inability to breathe slowly, get to sleep on time. The root of this is all in the nefesh. So important is the nefesh, this aspect of soul in the body. The Chazal put it into our davening. So every day in Shemona Esri, we have the blessing of Rifa'inu, where we ask for healing from Hashem. And then <clears throat> in most Sidurim, there's an aspect where you can put in your own personal prayer or prayer for someone else with their name. And the word says, may you offer a, a recovery, refuata nefesh ve refuata guf. We ask for a healing of the body and a healing of the nefesh. So Chazal understood that our health, our well-being, a, whole, a holistic approach involves healing the physical body, but also healing the nefesh, what's inside, lie, running through the bloodstream. All these emotions, all these energies flowing through us are an inherent component of healing. And this has to start being addressed more in all healing, not just for the kids. In, in the whole Western medical model, we have to start bringing the soul back into the medicine. Medicine has always been connected to soul. Um, um, I've, in, in letters I've read of Lubavitcher Rebbe where people have written for guidance in medical procedures, the Rebbe continuously writes how medicine, body and soul were always connected, a piece of medicine, and it was disconnected. It was taken apart. Here we're seeing proof how much soul and body are interconnected. There is no separating them and the healing of ourselves is going to involve both. This is a nice book on the topic by Rabbi Shmerla, Alternative Medicine in Halacha. He goes through different holistic healing modalities showing the Torah approval for them, showing how all this work, what we call energy work, is all um, <clears throat> wrecking most of it recognized, we, we recognize it as a creation of Hashem, Hashem Echad, everything is one, everything is from Hashem, we recognize the source, and we work with all of these different parts of us to get us to heal. Okay. Before I get into a, discuss, a, a description of the elements, so you can understand yourself and your children a little bit better. Let's first just touch on what's going on here. <laughs> so there are things that happen in life that, um, that bring on disease that I've mentioned. And there's a, core th there's a core cause that brings a lot of disharmony and disconnect into the body, into the home, into relationships, and that has to do with the heart. In Chinese medicine, the body and all of its organs are seen as a kingdom. The heart is the king, the ruler. And the heart represents the king, right, who sits on the throne. So the heart in the body is that part of us 
who can be calm, who can be present, who can love, who can think clearly, who can go to sleep at night, who can experience connection and depth in relationship. All of these things are missing. A big piece of this is missing in our children who are getting diagnoses, that list of diagnoses that we, we had before, the ADD, the ODD, depression. They can't connect. They can't get, make eye contact. They're uncomfortable with touch. They don't trust people, or even, sometimes even their own parents. Something broke, something got disconnected, and they've been cut off from their hearts. In the physical body, the heart does all the things I mentioned, but also governs blood flow and circulation, right? Blood flow and circulation are the, it's the core need of the body for all the organs to function at their optimal self and not bring on pain and disease. If the heart is impaired, if a person is cut off from their hearts for whatever reasons, blood flow is going to be impaired to the various organs. We're going to see different symptoms manifesting in the liver, high blood pressure, migraines, in the stomach, IBS and Crohn's, in the lungs, asthma, shortness of breath, in the kidneys, low back pain, bedwetting. If the heart has been affected and cut off, it's going to cut off blood supply to the rest of the organs. So we know this is a big, so this is a big, so this, uh, this concept of connection, of love, of presence is a big cause of disease in our medicine. And the good news is that it's also the cure. It's also the medicine. A lot of herbal medicine and acupuncture techniques for a lot of emotional and mental pain is related to restoring the heart to its flow and to its reign, to its being at the, on the throne of the kingdom, okay? So it's also, it's the medicine and then it becomes this restoring of connection to self and to child parent-child becomes the prevention of disease, God willing, as well. So the Western, there, so I, I know I've been a little hard on Western medicine. There are those in the, psych, the psychology and developmental world that speak to what I'm saying about this importance of heart and connection coming from their angle in the psychology world. This quote, <clears throat> is from Healing Developmental Trauma by Heller and LaPierre. And they write, it is the experience of being in connection that fulfills the longing we have to feel fully alive. This is presence. An impaired capacity for connection to self and others and the ensuing diminished aliveness, right? So being cut off from the heart, underlined I wrote, are the hidden dimensions that underlie most psychological and many physiological problems. So here too, the authors are pointing to this disconnection from heart, from love, from connection, being a root cause of mental and physical disease. The authors write that we all have five biologically based core needs that are essential to life. Connection, attunement, trust, autonomy, and love. Five basic needs when they're not met Mental and physical problems arise. A child, a person cannot self-regulate, has no sense of self, is not embodied, and self-esteem has not is not there. Okay? These authors trace a lot of this back. They're saying to shock and develop mental trauma. So we have to wake up to what is going on with our kids. Right? We want them to be regulated. We want them to be cleaning their rooms and putting their shoes on by themselves and knowing that they should be drinking water during the day um, so they don't get constipated. We have all these expectations of the kids, but they can't do these things. Why? The author's right. When children do not get their needs met, they do not learn to recognize what they need, are unable to express their needs, and often feel undeserving of, have their, of having their needs met. Why aren't children getting their needs met? I say this without judgment, but this is what I see. Why aren't kids getting their needs met by parents who love them and want to meet their needs? What's going on? 
These are things I mentioned before. Cons trauma and pain associated with conception and delivery of the child, which will then lead to broken attachment. Broken early attachment, depending on the mother or the father's life and what they've been through or what that event may have done, there's going to be a dissociation. Dissociated parents trying to connect with newborns who have all these needs. Um, sometimes, why are the kids not getting their needs? That they're misunderstood. We're not reading the cues. We can't see what they actually need. We don't understand their elements, their nature, and we don't understand what's going on in their lives. We're not clued in because we're not connected. Another reason the kids aren't getting their needs met are the physiological imbalances of the blood, tissue, nutrients, how they may have come into the world or the results of what I've just mentioned. There's ancestral trauma that the children carry, that we all carry. And there's a deficiency of love and chesed in the home. There's a lot of gvura, there's a lot of boundaries and what we do and what we don't do, and this is how you do it, and this is how you grow up, and this is how you play. But there's a bit of a deficiency in love. Coming from the parents, because of what's going on in the parent's life, because of a wall that was built up through no fault of their own, but the wall exists. Um, I take my inspiration and my healing a lot from Torah, and I saw this in Shira Shirin. It says in chapter two, my beloved resembles a gazelle or a fawn of the hind. This makes me think of children. So, so Shira Shirin's Song of Songs was written by King Solomon, and it's considered, it was said to be by Rabbi Akiva, the holiest book of the Torah. It's a love story between a man and a woman. It's a metaphor for the love and connection between God and Israel. And now I've, become, I've come to see it also as a love story between parents and children. So it says in chapter two, my beloved resembles a gazelle or a fawn of the hinds. I think of children on this. Behold, he is standing behind our wall looking from the windows, peering through the lattices. So this is the beloved, this is Hashem, always looking at us from behind the curtain, right? He can't fully reveal himself to us, but he's never gone. He's always peeking through the shades, watching, waiting, noticing, taking, right? He's there. But I, in, in the healing world, we have these walls up these walls to the heart, the, there's, there's, a, there's a literal, there's like a barrier, an energetic barrier to the heart that's not allowing love connection we can't receive, right? It impairs our relationships and our connections. So this wall, Kasleinu, he's standing behind our wall. This could be the wall of the heart. So too, with our children, I see this quote as, they're standing behind our wall. They're trying to connect. And I believe that a lot of their challenge, not all of it, it's not all the parents' fault, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we as parents are healers. We must be their healers, we are their parents. We spend most of, in the early years, their time, they spend their time with us. There's so much we can do to help them heal because healing cannot happen in 45 minute therapy sessions once or twice a week or in external healing modalities or medication supplements, it's not enough. They, the, the children need to be supported, regulated, seen on a constant, constant basis. But we have a wall that's not letting us fully see them and connect with them. And they're behind the wall and they're pushing <laughs> constantly. Tr the, the triggers we feel from our kids, especially the ADD, ADHD kids, the angry kids, I believe these are the kids of Geula. I believe these are the kids who have come into the world to trigger us into finally getting the healing work done. All the old pain, the ancestral pain we're carrying as a Jewish nation, as individuals, these kids are here, I think, to push us to break down this wall. They're saying, love me. Their behaviors are saying, love me, see me, hold me, touch me. 
get me. I taught a group of women in the five towns over the last 10 months. We did a parenting class based on these concepts, on the elements. And in the beginning, in the beginning of the class, I asked, why are you here? And the women said a lot of things. They said, I want more peace in my home. I want my kids to get along. I want my kid to get up in the morning and not fight with him every day. I want um, to give him what I didn't get. I don't want to make the same mistakes. A lot of different, um, a lot of different reasons. You know what nobody said? Really sweet, beautiful, amazing women, young mothers, what the, nobody said why they were in the class. No one said the word love. No one said, I want to love deeper. I want more love with my child. It was very profound. I think it's because, it's not that they don't want it, it's that we're so cut off from love, this concept of love, because of our heart walls. We're so focused on the order and the routines and what my kid needs to do and be, and what has to happen at home so I can function through my day and get into tomorrow and get back to work. We've forgotten the love. But the kids are here to get us back there, don't worry. And oh, so, what did the mother say? I can't do this work. I'm getting triggered. My kid's triggering me. I can't touch my child, right? Mothers, I can't touch my child. It's too hard for me. It triggers me. I'm too anxious, right? I can't sit at the dinner table with my child. It's too hard for me. It triggers my own childhood pain. Okay, we had to sit with this. It all, right? The pain came up to the surface, and we had to find out what was getting in the way. Where were our walls to our children? But again, I promise, the kids are here to heal us, and it's hard work, but Shir Shirim goes on. After it says um, that my beloved is appearing behind the wall, the children are behind the wall, it then goes on, verse 10, my beloved raised his voice, our children are raising their voices, <laughs> they're shouting, a lot of them, right? And said to me, arise, my beloved, my fair one, and come away. For behold, the winter has passed, the rain is over and gone, okay? The children are telling us with their behaviors and their shouting and their anger and their pain. We have to help them, but they're saying to us as their parents, my, my beloved, I love you, my fair one, come, the winter's over, the pain's over, the, the rain is gone. Let's have love, let's get connected, let's bring a ula, let's have peace in the home, connect with me. That's what feels so triggering. We're so cut off from the love. We're so cut off. I have to bring up this slide. I couldn't believe my eyes. I attended a school trip with my daughter. I, w I was so grateful to Hashem for that opportunity. For so many years, I wasn't doing that. And I got on this school trip with that kids to Ellis Island. And I could not believe my eyes, what I saw. This is a description of Jewish people and Jewish love before the two world wars. Okay, one reason we have so many walls to love. What does it say? In the, it's called the Kissing Post. In this area, immigrants were reunited with waiting friends and relatives who had preceded them to America. The emotional and joyous scenes that took place here prompted an Ellis Island matron to write the following in 1910. The manner in which the people of different nationalities greet each other after a separation of years is one of, interesting, one of the interesting studies at the island. The Italian kisses his little children but scarcely speaks to his wife, never embraces or kisses her in public. The Hungarian and Slavic people put their arms around one another and weep. The Jew of all countries kisses his wife and children as though he had all the kisses in the world and intended to use them all up quick. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. I like, wait, that's, they're describing Jewish people? That's amazing. But this is, then I realized this is before the world wars. This is before the absolute devastation and horror that our people experienced that naturally built up a lot of walls of healing because trauma will shut down the whole system and cut, people will have to cut out their emotions in order to survive, some. 
And so no one, so many of us as parents perhaps didn't learn how to feel or how to express feelings or how to be with someone else's feelings. I want to quote Rabbi Adin Steinzolt Satzal, an incredible sage and giver to the Jewish people in so many ways. He, there are multiple videos on YouTube, and there's one entitled How to Be a Good Parent. And Rabbi Steinzel goes into to parenting, and it's something that um, I really resonated for me um, and the study and work that I do. He emphasized being a good parent is not about having your way as a parent. <clears throat> it's not about what you want from them in terms of their career, their behavior, the style they dress. It has nothing to do with you, being a good parent. He also said it's not about getting love. He said a, par he said a mistake a lot of parents make is wanting love from their children. I know I just said we're cut off from love when we need love. <laughs> But you can't expect love from your child always for various reasons. You, we need to fill ourselves as parents with love. We need to get our needs met. We can't have it come from the kids. That's not appropriate. Um, a good parent, Rabbi Steinzelt says, says, I asks, what does this child want and what do they want to do? He says, for some people, this is natural. And for some people, it's we have to work much harder at it, okay? I'm in that company of working very hard. Ray Steinzel says, you need to ask who's in your garden. I have this nice picture of a garden that helps. <laughs> this, is, this is our kids. We have to get back in touch with nature a little bit. Who's in your garden, Ray Steinzel says. Is it a potato? Is it a rose? What is the nature of this child, of this flower growing in my garden, and how do I take care of it? What kind of nourishment does it need? How much water, how much light? This is what I have to know, and this is why we're gonna be studying the elements. You have to know the element of your child to know their needs. How much water, how much food, how much sleep? Rabbi Steinzelt says, you ha a person, you have to do your best for this plant to grow and be the best it can be. This is your mission. This is why you've been given this child. It's your job to work at it and to pray for it, he says. And then he says, it's a great deal of work. And the kids should not know about it. <laughs> they can't know about the work. They need to be happy, he says. And it is a great deal of work. It's a great deal of work, especially for the parents who struggled themselves as children and now have walls around their hearts that they have to break down while being a parent, while getting constantly triggered. It's very hard to work. And I hope today I've come with a solution to make it easier. And this is the, the feedback I got from the women I worked with over 10 months is yes, this work, this, these concepts, this information made their lives easier. They understand their kids better. They are connecting more to their kids. There's more affectionate touch at home. The children are communicating their needs. The parents know how to speak to the educators and explain the child's needs. And we're seeing physiologically better sleep from the kids, better appetite, a little more focus. It's beautiful. OK, so we're ready to get into the elements. <clears throat> A lot of this, as I, we've said, can be triggers for a person, but the triggers are the healing. The wound is the medicine. We just have to hang on and be strong and do it for the, because, because the kids are calling us to it. They're going to be easier days and harder days, and overall, as communication improves, it becomes easier. It becomes almost second nature. So let's get into it, the elements. The five elements, these describe nature and the life cycle and how, how we move through the year. So we start with water at the base. This represents infancy. This is the foundation of life, water. Okay, this is the time of winter. 
the circle moves clockwise. Then we move up into wood. This is the springtime. This is childhood, toddlers. This is, I didn't mention here, each element, each circle has not only its phase in the life cycle, but its organs, its emotions. So let me come back to water. Water's the winter, it's infancy, it's related to the kidneys and the lower back, the spine and the brain, the nervous system, the bladder, okay? Any symptoms in those parts of the body, we're looking at what happened in water. Moving, the, the emotion is going to be fear. And the gifts of water are wisdom and depth. And we're gonna see this in the kids. Moving up into wood, this is the springtime, this is um, in the Jewish life cycle, it's the time of Pesach. In, in the body, this is the liver and the gallbladder. Um, a lot of symptoms that show up from the shoulders, neck, and head. Migraines, eye, problem, eye, problems with the eyes will show up here in the wood section. This is also the control. This is a major piece. This is childhood. So. This is the liver, and so a lot of emotional pain and a lot of menstrual pain, um, a lot of anger and frustration, we're gonna be looking at the wood element, the wood in the children, and treating, treating them. That's why you may hear a lot of talk about the liver in healing and in, in holistic medicine. This is why, the children, okay? From wood, we move up into fire. This represents adolescence in the life, in, in the, in the, in the seasons, this is summertime, okay? This is the domain of the heart and the other organs around, around, so the heart protector, the pericardium, and also the small intestine and an organ of Chinese medicine called the triple warmer, which doesn't have a Western counterpart, which they think might be connected tissue. These are all related to the fire element. So any disharmony in the heart, insomnia, anxiety, brain fog, is gonna be here in the fire element. The capacity for connection and relationship is fire. Moving into earth, which is later in the summer, this represents mature, the maturity phase of life, um, maybe 30s, 40s, hopefully. Um, in a, and in the body, it is the, the di organs of digestion, the stomach and the spleen, the, the organs that take in nourishment. It's the capacity for thought. So any disharmony in thought, like obsessive, so compulsive thinking, or disharmonies in digestion, we're gonna be looking at earth. And then we move down the cycle into metal. In the Torah, the metal is air. The metal represents the autumn season. In the body, it's connected to the lungs and the large intestine. This is the aspect of letting go, of routine, of order, of awe, of speech, the metal is what we are asking so much of our kids and of ourselves. This is where perfectionism comes in. We expect us, ourselves and our kids to be at metal, to be at air, organized, have a routine, be meticulous, be detailed, know how to speak. But the problem is to get them there, to get your five-year-old, your eight-year-old, your 15-year-old, your 35-year-old self to have order and routine you have to look at what's come all before that time. How's the water doing? How's the nervous system? How was childhood, infancy, what happened? Early childhood, how is their liver? What's going on in their sinews and their tendons and their emotions? Do they have any connection? Do they have love? Do they have attachment? Are they properly fed and nourished and grounded in order to do what we're asking them to do, okay? These are, this is like a way to zoom out and understand what is going on underneath inside the bodies of our kids. Okay, this map shows you the emotions associated, associated with each element. It shows you the positive and the negative, the gift and the challenge of each element. Like the Alter Rebbe said, every aspect of the nefesh, each element, has a gift and a challenge. The positive and the negative, our work as parents in the earlier years is to, is to make our children aware of their elements, of their challenges, why they're getting angry so quickly, why they don't know how to let go, why it's hard for them to think clearly, 
explain it to them, and show them how to work with it. One more diagram, and then I am getting into the elements. This picture here shows, so I, I just moved through a cir the circle of life. It's the cycle of life, it's how the body works, it's how the emotions flow, hopefully in health and harmony. This is a diagram of what happens when things get thrown off kilter, when the body shuts down, when the nervous system breaks down, goes into fight or flight or shut down, and we have the ensuing um, physical pain and emotional pain. This is another way of lining up the elements, where fire and water and earth are the core axis of the person, the mind being the heart, the soul, the water being their roots, the core self, the, the digestive system. On the sides are the wood, which represents the ability to manifest, express, self-esteem. And then on the other side, the metal, which I talked about, the ability to have routine, order, the ability to grieve and let go. You cannot have the two things on the sides when this core has been thrown off. It causes a breakdown in the cycle, it causes a breakdown in the bodies, and then there's just this scrambling to survive. This is the, this, it's the same picture in the picture, the anatomy from a Western perspective of the brain the vagus nerve innervating all the organs and how when things get shut down by trauma and pain, you have havoc and disharmony in the heart. You have accelerated heart rate. You have shortness of breath. The digestive system is off. IBS, inability to eat, inability to process food, inability, constipation, bladder issues. You see how this vagus nerve innervates every single organ. Starting from on top, from the heart that's been shut down, that's been hurt. The good, it's, the good news is we can work with it. We can heal it. And it takes a lot of work. As Rabbi Steinzeld says, it takes time, work, and effort. And restoring, you have to treat all of the elements at the same time and try to keep the circle going, keep the body going, keep life moving while that core self is trying to heal and be seen. So I'm gonna do a little summary of each element to get a little taste of what, um, what there is to learn about. As I said, this was a 10 month course that I did with mothers. Um, I will be redoing the course with them um, to go a little bit deeper and also, God willing, starting it in the fall again for the second cohort. And there will be, God willing, an availability to join online in some capacity. But here is a little taste of the elements of your kids. You can, a lot of what I'm mentioning comes from two wonderful books by two Chinese medicine practitioners, Robin Ray Green, I'll have it up on a slide later. And um, Dr. Stephen Cowan wrote books about kids and the elements. The Bhavavi writes it, um, getting to know your soul. Um, there's so much out there now and more and more coming out. So the water element, the water child. What I, do in the, what I do in the course and what we have to do in life is get back in touch with nature. We have to spend time with nature, reconnect, right? Again, it's gonna feel sometimes counter, I, I can't connect, I'm, just, I'm, I'm triggered, I can't. I don't care about nature. I, yeah. Okay, so we have to get back into it. This is, we just, we are gonna get a little uncomfortable sometimes to reacclimate to, to reality. So water, you can see from these pictures, there's different types of water. There's a still lake, a rushing brook, the water I hold in my hands. Within each element, you're gonna have different types. So with, if you have a water child, a water constitution, you're gonna have a different water um, you may have different types of water. So this is not black and white work. This is not something you immediately peg and know right away because there's so much differentiation. But we get, we're getting a picture, an idea of what water is. So we think about what water brings up in us. Some people like water, some people hate it. Some people are afraid of it. 
Um, so we think about water, it can be still, it could be choppy, it could be amazing to swim in, it could be scary. It could be overwhelming, it can drown a ship. The water child, the water person, is someone who could be still on the surface, like the lake, but have a world underneath them. These children are very deep, they're deep old souls, very smart, very good long-term memory. Okay. Now, remember, we are composed, like our Torah sources told us, everything in the world is composed of all the elements. So all of us have all of the elements in the us, but we each have one or two dominant ones. And this is what we're looking for in the children and within ourselves to help us understand them, understand us, why certain things are challenging for us, and how to work, how to work with it. Okay? So this is the water in the child, but the water in all of us. This is the ability to be reflective, to internalize, to be an observer, okay? When challenged, this water person will get afraid. They may emotionally isolate. They're hyper, hypersensitive. They need space when they're upset. And they struggle with social nuances. They're like, these are the kids that get diagnosed with ADHD with inattention. They're like a little bit under the water, living underwater. Things aren't so clear all the time for them. These are the kids you have to repeat yourselves over and over and over again for, okay? But now that you know it's the water child, it can be done with peace. So the mothers that I work with told me, Okay, now I know my water child is going to take forever to get ready for the bus, and their mornings used to be filled with yelling and pressure and heartache. And imagine what this child is going through, getting yelled at all the time. Until the mother understood, wait a minute, this child has so much water. They're like just a little bit spacey, and they need a lot of time. This kid needs more time to get his shoes on. He's not like the my Moishi who can tie his shoes and out the door with a piece of toast hanging out of his mouth. No, this kid needs time. This is a water child. And she has a different connection with her son now, knowing this about him and giving him that space and that validation and the time he needs. Water children, they could be prone to low back pain and bedwetting. Right? This is why certain symptoms show up in certain kids and not other kids. It has to do with a the constitution. They're creative and imaginative. Um, there's, it's, it's, they have trouble with, trouble with punctuality, as we said, and sometimes trouble fitting in. Again, that social nuance is hard for them. The emotion is fear. When this element in them goes out of balance, they could be very dramatic, very timid, they're hyper, hypersensitive kids, deep, deep feelers. So life is hard for them because especially in our world here in New York, for sure, there's so much overstimulation of noise and color and light and to-do lists and scheduling. It's a lot for these kids. They need more time and they need less, okay? Um, these kids beat to the tune of their own drum. <laughs> if you have a water kid, you know what that means, okay? Quickly, parenting this, so parenting this child is gonna involve giving them a lot of time to do what they need to do. You might need to wake up a half hour earlier just for this kid. Don't yell and threaten this child. This child gets easily scared because the emotion of water is fear. We don't wanna yell or threaten anyway, but you're gonna further challenge this child if you do that. Because they're deep and their wisdom and the water element is associated with the brain, you can explain things to this child. If this child has trouble listening to you or, or following instructions, you can't threaten with a consequence. They don't care, usually. What they will listen to is an explanation because they're water and they wanna understand life. So if you explain the reason why you're asking them and you do it in a connected, respectful way, you'll find they're gonna do it faster because they get it now. Maybe that's some of this ADHD we're calling, right? Like when they're not listening or they're spacing, maybe because you haven't spoken to the part of them that makes them want to clue in, okay? These children might do well with neurofeedback and homeopathy. Definitely touch therapy, okay. 
again, it, it, and if we can't, um, we want to address the water now. We want to nurture and balance the water energy now because we don't want it to show up later in life in a person's 30s and 40s as sciatic pain, um, as bladder issues, um, and potentially even hormonal imbalances. We want to get the work done now if we can. Okay. Wood children. So many different types of wood in nature. You have a strong old oak tree, okay? You have the young sprouts of new light plant life, strong bamboo, so many different types of manifestations of wood energy in nature, in the world, so too with our kids. We see this either with low self-esteem, strong self-esteem, child that can be assertive, a child that can't be, a child that's really angry or its opposite really shut down and repressed. Different types of wood in the child. That's why we have to get to know our gardens. Okay. These are all the things that are associated with the wood element and that may show up in an imbalance in the child. The energy, the arrows are pointing up and out like a plant. So water energy is still and down, right? So these, the water kids like flop on the floor when they get home from school and they just spill, like a cup of water spilled over, they just spill out, okay? Wood children, their energy is up and out like the tree. So they're bouncing around, they're bouncing up and down. They need a lot of movement, a lot of energy expenditure. The voice associated with wood is the shout. These, these kids will make their voices heard, they shout. They express themselves, okay? The colors are, so, are important too. Wood kids, here's a woody kid, like the wood, they like the color green. They're gonna be drawn to green, you'll see. They'll want green shirts, they'll color green, okay? They have, you'll see even in their, in their physical makeup, their elements. So, so wood kids have a protruding brow. They may have a muscular body um, um, or a rectangle, rectangular face. Um, the, the water kids are more round, and because it represents infancy, they'll have more like baby soft skin. They're more fleshy. The wood kids are muscular, robust, like a plant, like, like a tree growing, really strong. These are the kids that are prone to headaches. Head, kids are adults. Headaches, muscle spasms, behavioral issues. But they also have gifts, right? They're very curious. They have, they have drive, they have, leadership, they have leadership skills. They can take control of a room sometimes, right? We want to get it into balance. This is why this course takes months because each element has so much to understand and to, to, to really start acclimate and feel and embody. And you start to feel it in the home with the kid. You start to feel one kid shouting at you you know it's the wood child, it's the wood in them, they're angry about something. Whereas with another child, the water child might be yelling, but there's so much fear and behind it and shaking in the voice. These are the things you start to understand when you study the elements. Okay. These kids, these, often, these kids often get, um, we'll go to the imbalance in a second, they need a lot of room to move, explore, they need exercise to stay in balance and they will always push their limits because they're plants, right? They wanna keep growing. They test, 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 test. The wood child out of balance will get easily frustrated and very angry. They're gonna be more intense and volatile when they're in pain. Uh, it's very hard when they don't get their way. They'll keep arguing as much as they can till they get their way. These are the kids more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD and ODD. And now we're hopefully understanding that that diagnosis is not enough and it's not fair because it's not a brain disorder. There's an emotional, energetic, organ disharmony inside this child that needs tending and the medications and the talk therapy are not enough. You're not getting to the core of what is going on with this child, which is inside this liver, this wood energy, very stuck, constrained, tight, screaming to be seen. 
in the medical world, okay, we use a needle, we use an herb, we have touch, things that we do to help soothe that liver, and that's something I teach parents, where to touch to help the wood element, but it's the connection again of the parents. You, the connection, the validation, seeing the child is sometimes enough. I'm working now with someone in their 30s whose wood was very damaged and shut down as a child. They were a wood child, energetic, talkative, fun, in your face, hyper, and was told constantly that they're too loud, be quiet, you're too much. Okay? And now this person experiences themselves as an adult who doesn't know what they want, doesn't know how to speak that what they want, doesn't know how to find the career they want. We have to support each other's growth. The way to parent a wood child, and this is hard because they're angry and shouting, but these are the kids that I said earlier who are pushing down our walls to our freedom and our healing, these are the wood kids. To parent a wood child in the face of such disrespect and anger sometimes, you have to respect them. The reason you have to respect them, I can't get into now, but it's rooted in Torah. The liver organ, keved, is the same word as kavod, honor and respect. These kids are our teachers in how to respect each other, how to respect, what does it mean to have a boundary? See me, it's connected to the eyes, the liver. They want to be seen and respected. And when they get that, the anger comes down. It's less stressful. It's less intense for them and their bodies, for you in, their, in your home, for them at school. They need to be seen. They need to be asked their opinion about things. They're like little adults, these wood kids. They need a lot of love. And yes, routine helps them, but you have to be connected for them to want to listen to your routines. The wood kids are very mischievous too. They're a lot of fun. The reason a lot of us have trouble with wood kids is because they're very strong energy. So if you're not a strong person yourself yet, it can be a lot to take. But again, they, they push buttons because they're, they're trying to push open, open, break open the heart. They're, they're teachers in opening up our emotional selves and well-being. Okay, let's move to the fire child. Fire child, this is, remember, summertime, this is adolescence. <clears throat> These kids are big free spirits and entertainers. They're performers, they love to be seen. These are the kids who wanna be in the Southeast, in the middle of like the family picture. They have a sparkle in their eyes, they're magnetic. They may be, they may be drawn to red and pink. Um, they easily burn out because they're a fire going, 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 going. Okay, these kids can be easily diagnosed also with ADHD. So now you're starting to see there's differences in these diagnoses that the kids are getting. Okay, <clears throat> they're moving around a lot. They can't focus, but why? And how do I get them to based on their element? These kids love to talk. The fire element is connected to speech. They love to talk, 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 talk. They come home from school. They want to tell you all about their day. Hopefully, do you have the energy for it? <laughs> the fire child um, can do well with touch, but has to be the right touch. Each of these kids, these elements like to be touched in a different way. The fire kind of touch is a soft touch. I teach this to parents. The wood child could be a little stronger because it's a muscular, robust element. Okay, maybe a high five, fist bump, um, quick hug. A water hug is very embracive, like, like uh, water spilling over. It can be like really mushy, and you can hold it for a while. The fire touch. So if you want to connect with the fire child, they don't they necessarily want that long, that long hug. Okay? These kids, because they're connected to the fire and the heart, they might be more prone to insomnia and anxiety. Um, their challenge will, can be with focus because of the mind, um, with impulse control, with moodiness. But remember, so with their challenges also comes their gifts. And so they can be very joyful, very fun, and very playful. Playful. People like to be around them. You can identify them because they have almond-shaped eyes. They have a smaller eye, smaller chin sometimes. Fire 
Fire types are, can be very small all over. When this child is out of balance, they can easily lose their temper. They can be anxious and fearful. They can be easily bored. They might show up as the class clown when they're in fear. Okay, they won't talk. They'll shut down their speech if they're mad at you. Okay, and they're going to need also need some space. Earth child. The earth child. This is the maturity phase. This is connected to the digestive system. The earth child. The earth person. Think of the earth. It's supportive. It's stable. The digestive the digestive system is associated with food and eating. These kids are nurturers. These are the natural caretakers of life. Like what you might think of as a natural mother. These are people who go on to become principals, perhaps of schools, nurses are a lot of earth people, caretakers, nurturers, feeders. These are the earth types and they're gonna be prone to digestive tr trouble because they're an earth type. That's where their pain will go. Also their challenge is gonna be with worrying and overthinking, okay? So we see this with the obsessive compulsive thinking. They love food. These kids love to be in the kitchen, cooking, helping mommy, but the challenge is going to be that they could be people pleasers. So that's something to look out for in the earth child. The color is yellow. They'll be drawn to yellow. You might even see yellow in their skin color for, with a very strong earth child. When they're out of balance, they can be easily, as I said, worried, but also messy. Okay? And it's going to, a little whiny, too. These are like whiny, clingy, earth out of balance. This is a case I'm like debating <laughs> to share if there's time. This is just a case of a 14 year old who came in with obsessive compulsive thinking. That medication was not helping at all. Um, we found out that the obsessive and intrusive thoughts were worse before her menstrual cycle. When did this all begin? It began a few months prior when the child heard about a traumatic incident that happened in the neighborhood. It didn't happen to the child herself, thank God. But just hearing about it flipped her nervous system into high gear and obsessive intrusive thinking began. Medication wasn't helping. She sat on the table in my office and said, I she looked at me, I didn't even ask, but she just knew the medication's not helping me. She just knew that the, this part of her wasn't being addressed, that the intrusive thoughts was coming from the breakdown in the nervous system, and now the wood fire. All these elements were off balance and not helping her. And just a few weeks on an herbal remedy and some acupuncture that worked to stabilize her earth so her obsessive thinking would stop, nurture her fire, get her get her nervous system, her fire and her water back online, and regulate her menstrual cycle at the same time, took them away. I also encouraged the mom to have more affectionate touch at home, which had stopped because she was a teenager, and this happens in some homes. The kids get older and we stop affectionately touching them. The metal child. This child can be also very challenging, like the wood child, this ch because this child is associated with the metal and the air element, they're perfectionists. They're very detail-oriented, and they get very upset when they don't have that perfection, order, and detail. Okay, so if you are an earth mother, an earth parent, or a water parent who doesn't care so much about details, and who's happy to live in a mess, you and this child are gonna butt heads. But now you're gonna know why, <laughs> and you can work with it. Okay, they, they're rule followers, they, they stand for justice and what's right, they're gonna be upset if so-and-so, if their sibling got, did something wrong and didn't get punished, they're gonna point it out to you and wait for you to do something about it. This is associated with the lung and large intestine, so we might see asthma, eczema as part of these ch children's challenges. These are also very artistic, artistic kids and very sensitive, they're, because they're connected to air and the lungs, it's a very ethereal, spiritual element. They're highly sensitive and they're highly artistic. That's their gift. Grief is going to be the challenge of a metal person. And out of balance 
we talked about, they can be extreme, they can take things too seriously, they can have the weight of the world on their shoulders, okay, and they get obsessed with rules. To help a metal child speak their language, details. So if you're giving instruction about how to clean up the playroom, you wanna give it to them with details and where things go, because that's how their brain thinks. That's how their brain functions. They can understand that. They can't just understand being told, clean the room. So these are, these are the five elements in a very, very short summary. Hopefully we've gotten to see the, um, the intricate nature that all of us are made up with. Nature is, and each of us have all these elements, all these parts, moving parts to us. We have one or two dominant parts that are going to be how we express ourselves in the world, and they're also how we need to be nourished in the world. And so I see this as a vehicle of really healing connection with self and at home and healing the kids and their physiological challenges by really understanding who they are and then being able to meet their needs. And as we meet their needs more and more, our walls break down because we're becoming more and more present to what is in front of us. So to heal the heart, to get present, to get a whole involves getting present. That feels impossible. How do you do that? You just do it, right? You, do, you, you don't have it yet. You don't understand it yet. You do it anyway. And I promise you, you start getting it your physiology changes, your emotions change, your nervous system changes. The kids are happier, they're talking to you, they lean in for the hugs more. But to do all this work, like Rabbi Steinzel says, it's, which is hard work, what do we have to do? We need to take care of ourselves as parents. We need to heal also. We need to spend time in nature and do what calms our nervous systems. We have to watch the raising of our voices. It's not helping us or the kids. We have to eat breakfast. Everyone has to eat. We have to become observers. We have to not judge the kids and the behavior so quickly, but stand, zoom out and see what is she showing me? What is he showing me? What is this movement, this element I'm being guided to so that I can stay in connection with the child? Not judge, dismiss, punish, and push away. We always want to keep connection because remember what I said in the beginning, connection is where the break to the disconnection is where the breakdown of the heart and the body began. Here's a list of a few things of some holistic modalities that are very helpful for kids in healing, no matter the diagnosis, okay? Acupuncture is something that um, is helpful for kids, I would say, over age 10. Under age 10, it's not so fun for them. They're not so interested in needles. They can do herbal medicine. They can do massage therapy. They can do craniosacral therapy. Is it? Awesome, awesome modality in balancing energy and helping the core self heal in a safe, safe way, very subtle way. Herbal medicine, Bach flower remedies, essential oils, emotion code and body code therapy is something I see a lot working tremendous results with young children and their parents in healing old, old emotional wounds. It unblocks, it takes it, it removes layers of blockages to the heart that's, and to the body and that allows it to heal at an accelerated rate. Massage and neurofeedback as well really help the kids. So thank you for your time. These are the books I mentioned about the elements. Dr. Stephen Cowan, Robin Ray Green wrote amazing books about kids and the elements. Um, the Bhavavi wrote Getting to Know Your Soul understand this from a spiritual perspective. And um, that, is, that is today's talk. This is the nature of, of the course, of the 10 week course living with, 10 month course living with the elements. It's understanding the nature of each child and their element, knowing their constitution, learning about ourselves to help the physical body and the emotional body heal to restore connection with the child, with ourselves, to enhance the healing process. It will save a lot of time and a lot of money in life when there is adequate connection and um, healing happening on a regular basis in our homes with our kids.
Thank you very much.